Uh, thank you, Simone. This is a great introduction. Very nice to join you from uh, from Canada. Uh, can you see my slides, the title slide? Yeah, looks good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so as Simone alluded to, I'm going to talk about single cell sequencing today. Uh, exploded is definitely the right word. There's a lot of data out there. So I'm going to be giving um, sort of the first, most of the talks really going to talk about our work in single cell sequencing of glioblastoma stem cells. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to talk about a software solution uh, that we're using to sort of federate and integrate a lot of the uh, the world's cancer single cell data, a system called Crescent. Uh, so to start off with glioblastoma, really the crux of this talk is on this assumption that glioblastomas have self-renewing cancer stem cells. And these are really at the root that contribute to initiation of tumor and the advent of therapeutic resistance. And this is really the concept of a stand-up to cancer, um, cancer stem cell dream team led by Peter Dirks, where uh, there are multiple investigators all tackling this question using multiple different assays. And my role in that team uh, was to lead a lot of the uh, the single cell work, both using glioblastoma stem cell lines, as well as profiling uh, primary uh, patients' tumors. Uh, the real workhorse here was this glioblastoma stem cell culture system that Peter Dirks and Sam Weiss uh, both have uh, pioneered and set up in their labs. Uh, in general, the workflow is we start with a primary GBM, there's dissociation and culturing, um, the, bulk, uh, the bulk cells die, brain tumor stem cells survive, and then there are two different culture conditions uh, currently in use across those two labs and here in a sphere based system. Uh, and both Peter and and Sam have basically a long history of characterizing these cultured glioblastoma stem cells. And we wanted to come in from a genomics perspective to answer some questions around tumor heterogeneity. Uh, how do specific transcriptional patterns compare across uh, different patients in GSCs? And then look for these glioblastoma stem cells in primary tumors themselves. Uh, so the first question we wanted to answer really very fundamentally was, are brain tumor stem cells or glioblastoma stem cells composed of subpopulations? Are they homogeneous, as on the left, or are they heterogeneous? Are they multiple populations uh, used under the uh, model on the right? Uh, and this is the most expensive slide in the entire slide deck. This is all the single cell data um, that we generated for the study from glioblastoma stem cell lines. Uh, each box is an individual line. Uh, each dot is a single cell. Uh, we've used the 10x Genomics Chromium platform, extremely popular for, for this type of work. Uh, and conceptually, essentially, each cell is encapsulated in an oil droplet. Uh, and there's a, essentially a reverse transcriptase um, reaction that happens within the droplet and barcodes each cell. Um, I've ordered these cells by um, the number of transcriptional clusters. So the way to read this plot, each color is the number of, uh, of clones. So green means in clone number one, orange means clone number two. So these are the clonal stem cell lines. As you get to this point, now we have now we see emergence of a third clone, a fourth clone, and so forth. And we had one single IDH mutant line. This was by far the most transcriptionally heterogeneous across the entire across the entire cohort. Uh, so this is really observation number one. These weren't clean monoclonal um, stem cell lines, even in the stem cell uh, compartment, we observe heterogeneity. And I'd even argue these ones that say that C2 or that we've annotated this to are, are really just one transcriptional clone, just one population is actively cycling. We always see this. And then one is in the, the non-cycling state. Um, so really just right off the bat, there was really a, an extreme diversity, even just in counting uh, subclones across these uh, GSC lines. Um, I'm, my background is cancer genomics. I didn't really come from a stem cell background. So of course I jumped immediately to, oh, it must be copy number variation. It must be genomically driven. Uh, so this is the first uh, experiment we did to try to understand um, the root of uh, glioblastoma stem cells uh, heterogeneity. And I've just shown one example here. Uh, so this is one line, G637 had four transcriptional subclones. And we used a tool called infer CNB to infer from the RNA sequencing data the presence of large-scale copy number alterations. Uh, you can see that over here on the left, each tiny, basically one pixel thick uh, track in here is a single cell. And the real key to get this to work was comparing the GSCs against a, um, uh, not just a tissue matched, but a cell matched uh, normal. So we had a set of normal oligodendrocytes 
And we essentially are looking for in, inferring copy number variation using the expression matched to the appropriate cell of origin. And what we saw here was, uh, first of all, highly clonal copy number variants that were shared across every, uh, across every population. But as you can see here, these colors on the left match these colors over here. Uh, there were subclonal populations. So this population here having a loss of 10, this sub-sub clonal population having a loss of 20. And you can actually play this game all day. You can actually attempt to pick out these very, very small subpopulations that we wouldn't have found using our automated uh, clustering-based approach. Um, so this worked fairly well. Uh, but in general, we could not explain uh, the, uh, every single subclone on the basis of genomic genomic alterations alone. There's really much more to these subclonal populations than just large copy number gains and losses. Uh, and the other challenge was we really didn't have a lot of shared genomic alterations across the patients. So now I've zoomed back out. We're now looking at um, the equivalent data, but for all of the patients, all the uh, glioblastoma stem cell lines individually, uh, and what we found was they really were all different. They did not cluster together. They didn't share a large number of copy number alterations beyond those already known from the Cancer Genome Atlas and other studies. But we were looking for a uniting set of biology if there were one. Uh, so we took this data on the left and performed a principal components analysis and essentially found two principal components uh, that really nominated this developmental program on one end and the injury response on the other end. And once we'd actually seen these two scores, we actually found, even just anecdotally, the developmental um, or the GSEs that were more enriched for um, developmental programs, or uh, principal component one, were situated at the top of this UMAP plat plot, and the injury response programs were situated roughly at the bottom. And the other good sort of sanity check was when we have multiple lines from the same tumor, these are uh, more transcriptionally similar to one another than other tumors. Uh, so this is sort of our first look at um, not necessarily trying to bin um, the stem cell lines into a specific developmental or injury response bucket, but really this idea of a gradient as we move between these two uh, transcriptional programs. Uh, so we dug a little bit deeper. We pulled out these two specific programs, essentially gene sets uh, that we defined from that first set, and scored them across all of the lines. And what I've done here is I've sorted all of these all of these lines by their uh, by their injury response score. So over here at the developmental high and the injury response low. And in general, these two uh, programs were essentially mutually, or not quite mutually exclusive, but were inversely correlated. So we have these populations here in the middle. And what this figure shows essentially is pulling out what is the rate, what is the um, relationship between scoring on the injury response or the developmental program. So you can see this uh, GSC line over here on the left very heavily um, uh, very heavily uh, developmental, contrast this to a highly injury response uh, driven tumor, but it wasn't that clean. And in fact, most of the lines were somewhere in between these two states. And these are just two other examples here, sort of showing cells somewhere on this, uh, on this axis. Uh, here's another way to show this. And our real issue was we essentially wanted to define the entire gradient. Essentially, each GSC line is a sampling across this gradient. And what really emerged in, in this work is really the need to profile large numbers of glioblastoma stem cells from many different lines. We found each patient essentially, uh, their GSC line occupied a, a narrowly defined uh, window upon this gradient. Uh, but by sequencing large numbers of lines, we can actually start to fill in what this gradient actually looks like. And it does appear to be largely continuous um, between developmental and injury response states. And the next question we had was, okay, we have this phenotype, we have this uh, this gradient to score. Uh, is there re are there really any functional differences between them? Uh, so Peter's lab did a, a, sp a sphere forming uh, assay, essentially um, a sphere a sphere forming assay. And what we saw there was essentially the developmental um, the developmental uh, GSCs were more likely to uh, form uh, to form spheres relative to the injury response. Um, samples. Same story for injury or for tumor formation when these cells were um, orthotopically injected into uh, mouse xenografts. Uh, the take rate was basically 100% for the developmental and uh, roughly three quarters um, for the injury response uh, uh, the injury response lines. Uh, however, there was really no survival benefit. So also really mirroring what we saw in glioblastoma. While there still may while there still may be functional differences between the two lines. This is still a fatal and lethal disease, and we really could not distinguish these on the basis of xenograft survival uh, alone. 
Uh, we did want to drill in a little bit deeper. We didn't want this just to be a transcriptionally driven signature. Uh, so now we worked with Stefan Anger. He applied the uh, TKO V3. This is from uh, Jason Moffat's group here in Toronto. 70, 71,000 guides across essentially all protein coding genes. Uh, we screened, screened 11 glioblastoma stem cells. In this case, looking for um, uh, functional or uh, essential, uh, basically looking for uh, essential genes uh, across each of the lines and then looking for a correlation across these lines totally independent of the developmental and injury response gradient. Uh, and what we find was again even using the functional data very clean clustering of the developmental uh, of the developmental cases and the injury response cases. Um, so I do want to emphasize that this was totally unsupervised essentially these tumor or these um, these GSC lines all found the exact same cluster on the basis of CRISPR of a CRISPR feeding data uh, alone. Um, so having characterized this in the glioblastoma stem cells, we then want, really want to turn into uh, to primary tumors. We really want to understand, do we see this gradient in the wild? Is this something we're just seeing in culture? Is this sort of a, a, a novel finding um, just in a, a culture condition? Or can we actually find these GSCs in not just our own data, uh, but in other uh, groups' data as well. And I've, we essentially took the uh, G, uh, the developmental and injury response gradients, uh, applied that to Neftal, Dermandis, uh, Wang, and Badrudi data, and we essentially see the very uh, similar patterns. So this is our data over here. These are GSEs. Uh, so you can see a, a developmental low, developmental high peak, and an IR high and IR low peak. And you actually uh, see this data actually in other groups' data as well. Uh, in this case, this is a combination of technologies, so 10x, SmartSeq2, um, there's some nuclei in here, there's whole cells, but over and over and over again, we see these two same gradients relatively uh, uh, inversely correlated, uh, but uh, potentially obscured by signal in the bulk tumor cells. So our conclusion from this analysis was the GSCs appear to have this developmental IR gradient, but it's not necessarily um, you know, um, sort of passed on to the actual bulk, uh, the bulk cells themselves. Uh, so this led to a search for GSCs or glioblastoma stem cells in uh, the primary tumors, attempting to differentiate GSCs uh, from bulk tumor. Uh, and this is what that analysis looked like. We essentially took that huge uh, compendium. We did some of our own uh, tumor sequencing as well, uh, both single nuclei and single cell. Uh, we did a trajectory analysis, so we essentially wanted to differentiate the GSCs. So all of our GSCs fell in this region here, essentially on this developmental injury response axis. But uh, in contrast, we actually found this third bulk population that corresponded to an astrocytic uh, differentiation signature. Um, so we've essentially uh, mapped out the GSCs uh, and the bulk tumor. Of course, there's going to be some overlap here. Uh, but the, the conclusion from this analysis, especially from the conclusion uh, from the trajectory work, was that bulk tumor cells appear to flow from progenitor GSEs. Um, so essentially, your GSEs are mapped onto this part of the gradient. We believe there are genetic abnormalities in those GSEs that have halted them them somewhere on this gradient, and then they essentially wait for an injury stimulation of some sort. Uh, the type of injury is actually uh, subject of another grant um, Peter and uh, Gary Bader and I have recently received to try to figure that out. Uh, essentially, once the tumor is sort of locked on this point in the gradient, they then start to spin out these uh, bulk populations. And you can see that flow very well here on this trajectory analysis where you have the GSCs um, essentially preceding what we see in the, the bulk tumors. And same story here, if you recolor the exact same data using both the, either the developmental or injury or the developmental or injury response scores, it's really the same type of story. These stem cells are giving rise to these bulk tumors. Uh, so this was essentially the subject of a work we just published in uh, Nature Cancer in, Jan uh, in January. Uh, there's just a huge pile of additional data in the uh, in the supplement, uh, but that was really the, uh, the the finding there. It was really this idea of a gradient, potential um, genetic alterations locking specific GSCs at a specific point on the gradient, and then these giving rise to bulk tumors. Um, so we did want to, my lab's a translational genomics lab, so we sort of arrived at this question. Uh, gradients and clusters may be biological interest, biologically interesting, 
Uh, but how do we act on it? What is the application uh, for patients? This is still work that's, uh, that's ongoing. Uh, the question we're trying to answer is we now know these GSC populations are relatively heterogeneous, not as heterogeneous as a bulk tumor, but there is certainly heterogeneity. Uh, now we have a framework to measure heter heterogeneity. Is there a way to act to nominate drugs effective against the orange cluster, a drug against the yellow cluster, and ultimately the combination where we can put these two drugs together and wipe out the GSC population um, completely? Uh, so this leveraged a collaboration with um, Dr. Benjamin Habekanes here in Toronto. He is a database called PharmacoDB, where he's taken all the world's uh, high throughput uh, drug screening data, so 60, over 6,850,000 uh, drug, uh, drug cell line pairs. I quite like this uh, website because it takes data that I find quite difficult to federate and arrange and puts it all into one searchable place. And essentially there's he now has an algorithm that sits on top of this that will take a gene expression profile and ask the question, what cell line uh, looks most like that gene expression profile and what drug has it responded to in these high throughput drug screening studies? Uh, really an ideal partner for our single cell data where we are able to define expression clusters at the single cell or single cluster level. Uh, and this is really the current framework we're just working up now. So this is all relatively new. Uh, so I've just shown one example here. We have a single line with two clusters. Uh, I haven't shown the, cluster, the cycling cluster here. So these are two totally transcriptionally distinct clusters. Um, we pass the data from these two clusters individually to the Pharmaco, uh, to the PharmacoDB program. And essentially he nominated uh, effective, or, um, uh, Desatinib as being effective against cluster one. Serafinib as being effective against cluster two. And we specifically wanted to choose drugs here that were not effective in the other cluster. So there may have actually been higher scores for these two clusters, but we did want to see this differential cluster response. Um, we then did a dose finding assay. So this is work with R.T. Lunchman in Sam Weiss's lab, uh, essentially looking at a dose response curve to arrive at an IC50 for these two drugs against the bulk tumor. So in this case, we don't have uh, single cell or single cluster information. Uh, and then we did, then uh, RT did the, the combination experiment, essentially starting with these IC50s and going downward in both directions. And what we found actually, the combination of the drugs was much more effective at several log lower doses than either drug individually. Uh, so this is really just a proof of principle at this point. Uh, we're now scaling this up um, uh, under the, uh, the framework of this new grant uh, to really come up with this idea of precision medicine at single cell resolution taking clusters that we can now measure from single cell, previously invisible by bulk RNA sequencing, uh, nominating individual drugs against clusters, uh, and then testing these uh, in the lab. Uh, and this is really um, really where we are now. Um, so um, Hubert Lampley actually wrote a very interesting review uh, of our work in Nature Cancer just in February. Uh, and actually not just our work, there are actually three back-to-back -back, uh, studies in glioblastoma, all illustrating specific types of gradients associated with their specific uh, technology. And in this review, actually, they really articulated this uh, interesting sort of, I guess, evolution from the, the uh, previous system, really looking at uh, binning uh, cancers into specific uh, molecular subclassifications, and really to this move of more of a gradient-based um, thinking about how to classify individual cells and individual clusters. So if you haven't read this yet, I highly I uh, highly recommend it. It really does a great job of bringing together um, three very nice stories, specifically in the, the um, almost the biological gradient uh, space. That's actually completely compatible with uh, with past thinking of GBM uh, classification. Uh, where this work is really sitting now, we're trying to link the single cell clusters to additional phenotype data, um, specifically pathology. We have incusite images. Uh, we also have in addition to high throughput screening, um, epigenetic probe screening done by Cheryl Aerosmith as part of the Structural Genomics Consortium. So really looking at this uh, drug combination nomination um, approach. Uh, mapping the GSC gradient positions in both primary and relapsed tumors. We have another study now um, essentially using the exact same technologies, but now we have these pairs. The question we want to answer there is, is a patient's relapse at the same position on the gradient as, uh, as it was at, uh, in the primary? Uh, and then the third, this uh, drug combination uh, effort, and specifically interpreting that data through the lens of position on the developmental uh, injury response gradient. 
Uh, so that's sort of the biological part of the talk. I did want to make sure I had time to talk about um, some issues. I don't, uh, I don't, I, it's very tempting to sort of look at um, these papers. You see these great images, they all are clustered together. Uh, but it's really not that easy, especially as we start to bring in uh, public data. And this is really an, an, something we ran into when we start to take uh, published data and want to integrate it and score the gradient on our own. Uh, and specifically, the gap for lack of single cell RNA sequencing uh, techniques aware of things that go wrong in the cancer genome. So uh, techniques that are aware of aneuploidy, highly skewed transcriptomes, uh, differences in, in technology, use of nuclei versus single cells, um, the lack of reference set, so I showed that example in the, the copy number alteration, really the need for algo data sites very, very specifically to normalize our copy number data to, uh, to pull out uh, subclonal populations, and ultimately infrastructure to pull all this data and summarize it uh, in a standardized way. So these were all sort of boots on the ground uh, issues that we ran into uh, as, part of, uh, as part of this study, and that led to the development uh, of Crescent which is an acronym for the Cancer Single Cell Expression Toolkit, where we wanted the ability for any user in the wor world to have single cell RNA sequencing data, the ability to provide their own metadata, and to mash that up with reference data sets. Um, we wanted to build this, this box in the middle, which essentially would take all of this data and post it, uh, and then output and run standardized pipelines and produce interactive quality control maps, uh, the ability to do dimensional reductions, generate UMAPs, allow you to search specific genes or perform gene set enrichment on your own, uh, and perform diff differential gene expression data, and then share those results uh, with your collaborators. Uh, so you want to check this out. This is available at uh, crescent.cloud. I just want to show some examples of uh, where the system is at now. Um, so here's the website. If you log in, there's two tabs. There's the public tab. So this is all the public data. Um, a lot of this is actually held up and just applying for especially controlled access data and so we can uh, analyze it and um, uh, make the gene expression profiles available. Um, but also the ability to upload your own single cell data. And essentially this page, you can see there's a scroll. Um, the basically, we want there to be pages and pages of public data. Currently we have 150,000 cells from 74 data sets from 10 uh, studies. Uh, but of note, there's actually a lot of data that um, that our users have uploaded, but still have kept private. Um, so to the comment of the, these technologies that's exploding, there's a ton of data out there. Uh, the real challenge is um, access to infrastructure to start integrating uh, and sharing this data amongst labs. Um, so we have drank our own Kool-Aid. We, um, we put our own data uh, in this website. You can log in and see it today. Uh, these are all the, uh, the names for all the cell, uh, for all the different um, glioblastoma stem cell lines. Uh, in addition to standardized pipelines, you can see I'm playing around with some different configurations here. We also will make the analysis exactly as published uh, by the author. So there's a specific card that you can uh, click on and then navigate through all the various settings or change them if you want to run your own pipelines or uh, perform quality control of publicly shared data. Um, so you may recognize this. This is that, that GSE developmental uh, injury response gradient here. Here's the bulk tumors out here. You can play with this metadata all you want. This is all user controlled. Uh, and it has the ability right in your browser to put up two, the same UMAP uh, side by side, but then apply different annotations. So in this case, these are all the, uh, the patient identifiers. And, and you can see essentially by eye, the GSCs are clustering mostly up here, but we also make the, uh, the tumors available uh, in, this long, uh, in this long tail. Um, so that data is all there. Uh, happy to answer any questions as people dig into this and some of the other data sets that we've made available uh, through Crescent. Uh, so I think I'm just coming up to the end of my time. So I'll just uh, highlight what I've shown, at least in the glioblastoma stem cell space, uh, has just been published in Nature Cancer in January. Um, really a Herculean effort by Laura Richards and Owen Whit uh, Whitley uh, from my lab and Gary Bader's lab, uh, respectively. Uh, Peter Dirks really pulled us all together, uh, along with Sam Weiss as part of the Stand Up to Cancer program, and Stéphane Anger, who did all that, that beautiful functional work, uh, has an ongoing program. Uh, looking at that in the other G, uh, GSC lines. Uh, funders, uh, largely of the Stand Up to Cancer um, Dream Team, a lot of uh, funding um, to my lab for the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation and the Canada Research Chairs. Uh, I'll also advertise our Toronto Single Cell Analysis Toolkit. I put Toronto in quotes because it's long outgrown Toronto. This is now an international group, uh, really for asking 
um, really technical questions. How do you isolate nuclei? What algorithm should I use? Um, we advertise funding, uh, funding opportunities. Um, so sort of an interactive place for people to meet and talk about single cell sequencing, uh, highlighted crescent. And then we also run this as a core service. So uh, fresh cells don't travel very well, but certainly uh, single nuclei sequencing is something that we do from all around the world. And I just put that link here. Uh, so at that point, I'll leave it here and I'm happy to take any questions.